All right, Alexander, we have some news from the European Union. The foreign ministers uh, met. They tried to uh, put sanctions on Belarus and they tried to push forward sanctions on Turkey. The sanctions on Turkey have to do with the East Med. Pushing those sanctions, obviously, are Cyprus and Greece and France, of course, France and Macron. And uh, the Belarus, the initiative was kind of, um, I imagine it's coming from Germany, even though I don't think Germany, you know, came right out and said, we want sanctions. You know, Germany kind of works a little bit in the shadows and gets other people, gets other people to move forward. But they tried to package it as an EU thing. And I think they even made statements that the EU does want sanctions against Belarus. I still don't understand why they want to sanction Belarus for having an election. I don't get it. But they blamed the fact that they couldn't put sanctions on Belarus. They kind of tied the two together. And they said they couldn't put sanctions on Belarus because Cyprus said that if you don't put sanctions on Turkey, which they couldn't come to an agreement on, then we won't let you push forward the sanctions on Belarus. So they they actually threw it on Cyprus. But the Cyprus foreign minister, Christo Dulidis, actually made a statement today. And he said, no, that's not how it happened. Let me just read you what he said very quickly to the uh, to the media in Cyprus, and then you can comment on this story. And uh, Christo Dulidis said, this is not how things operate in the EU. This is what he told the state broadcaster, CYBC. He explained that during the informal meeting of the EU foreign ministers in Berlin earlier this month, there was a long discussion on Belarus and Turkey, and it was jointly agreed that these two issues ought to be promptly promoted and efforts completed before the Foreign Affairs Council, the FAC meeting, on Monday. And I'm pulling this from the Cyprus Mail. After the meeting in Brussels, word got out, however, that the FAC failed to agree on sanctions against Belarus because of Cyprus's demands on Turkey. But Christodoulidis said it wasn't so. He told CYBC on Wednesday that during discussions in Brussels, a number of countries backed the position that the process should be based on the political agreement in Berlin. Some other countries, headed by Germany, said that in view of discussion at the European Council on the whole spectrum of EU-Turkey relations, their approach of the German Chancellor is that this issue is referred to the European Council. Christodoulis said that based on the agreement, both issues ought to be promoted to the European Council, which is what happened. Nothing more, nothing less. So that is how Christodoulidis explained it. He said Cyprus didn't put a stop to anything, but it sounds to me that Cyprus just wanted both of the the initiatives, both of the sanction proposals, pushed up, referred, in his words, to the European Council. What do you make of this interesting story, Belarus, Turkey, sanctions, all this stuff going on in uh, the European Union? Well, it's it's a classic example of the European Union being bitterly divided about policy, unable to make up its mind and looking around for a scapegoat. And that scapegoat in this case was Cyprus. Cyprus isn't going to stop sanctions against Belarus. It's not interested in that. I mean, nor is it going to do anything as foolish has linked that issue with a completely separate issue of sanctions against Turkey and lose goodwill by doing that. I mean, this is just a fairy tale that the Europeans are inventing. The simple fact is there is big division in the EU about what to do, not just with Belarus, but about with Russia. And I just want to say a few things about this, because what, first of all, who is pushing for sanctions, who is not? The countries that are always pushing pushing for sanctions against Russia and Belarus are Poland, the Baltic states, factions within the German government. Who is resisting sanctions against Russia and uh, Belarus? Uh, well, obviously, there's countries like Hungary, um, you know, those sort of countries which are averse to sanctions anyway. But basically... The countries that make the decision that oppose the sanctions are France, Italy, and factions within Germany. Germany is split on this. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, they were talking about imposing sanctions against individuals in Belarus, but not imposing sanctions on Lukashenko himself, which is a bizarre position to take. But the Germans were apparently saying, well, we've got to keep our... Uh, you know, our, our, our lines of communication to Lukashenko open. The reality is that the European Union has completely messed up with Belarus. Belarus, until a few months ago, 
was trying to play this game or Lukashenko was trying to play this game of being on the one hand pretty close to Russia, but on the other hand, trying to keep you know the doors open to the European Union, resisting initiatives from the Russians to integrate Belarus more closely with Russia. And we've had lots of incidents with Lukashenko and Putin having up rows about gas prices and oil prices and Russian mercenaries passing through Belarus and all of these things. And what happened was there was the election on the 9th of August. Uh, Lukashenko won. And I'm now getting pretty clear indications that he not only won, but won convincingly, by the way. Maybe not 80%, but he did he did win convincingly. We then saw protests. Those protests rapidly morphed into a color revolution attempt, um, which the European Union very foolishly backed. They started talking about Lukashenko as being an illegitimate president. Lithuania is actually talking about Lukashenko as being an illegitimate president. What then happened was that Lukashenko faced the protests down and turned to Russia. And now he's had this meeting with Putin in Sochi, which took place uh, a week ago, in which the uh, a whole initiative of integrating Belarus with, with Russia, which Putin, Putin has been promoting and Lukashenko has been resisting is now is now being accelerated. So some people in the European Union, and I suspect one of the most vocal figures here is Macron, who has his own views, are saying, oops, we've completely messed up. Let's take a step back and think hard whether this policy of sanctions is really wise because it's now quite clear that Lukashenko is not going to fall. Um, so rather than starting to sanction him and his officials and his government, when we've been trying to win them over, now that he's not going to fall and it's clear that the opposition doesn't amount to anything, let's instead try to keep all the doors open. Uh, the trouble is, of course, doing that makes the European Union look incredibly weak. And of course, from Lukashenko's point of view, completely untrustworthy. So I don't think he's going to go down this route. But when the Europeans mess up, as they've just done, of course, they can't admit they've messed up. They can't admit you know, that backing a, a color revolution in Minsk was a bad idea getting diplomats to go and lay flowers at where a protester died in Minsk was a bad idea. Talking about Lukashenko being an illeg illeg illegitimate was a bad idea. What they, go, what they do instead is they say, well, we can't agree on, Cy uh, on sanctions, so we're going to blame Cyprus. And that's what they've done. They've just scapegoat scapegoating C Cyprus to conceal their own divisions and the complete failure of their policy. Why? Okay, so here's my question to you. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. Fine. The European Union supported a color revolution. It wasn't the first time they've done that. They did it in Ukraine. Why, why go down the sanctions route? Can't you just say if you're the European Union and you're part of those factions that supported the color revolution in Belarus, you can say, okay, we supported it. We failed. Let's just forget about it. Let's just tell the media not to report on it. They could easily do that. Tell the media not to report on it. Let's just turn the page and move on. Instead, they went down the sanctions route. Why? What do you benefit by sanctioning Belarus, who I may remind everybody is not even in the European Union? They've done nothing to the European Union. If anything, they want to they want to be more open to the European Union and they want to, you know, approach the European Union with trade and travel and all kinds of things like that. So why sanction them? It's completely it doesn't make any sense at all. Well, it's, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you know, a, a comment that I've made many times on our, vid on our videos, when you are in a hole, stop digging. And once this policy of confronting and trying to leverage, lever Lukashenko out of power failed, the last thing you should do is double down on it and force him into even greater dependence on Russia. The only thing you achieve by doing that 
is you increase further the <laughs> ties between Belarus and Russia, which is the opposite of what you say or what you seem, seem to say that you want to achieve. But that's the European Union for you. These guys have no reverse gear. They don't know when to stop. They don't know. They don't, they're not capable of saying to themselves, as, you know, more serious countries, well, serious, the you know, European Union isn't even a country, more serious foreign policy people are, well, you know, we tried it, it didn't quite work, so let's pull back and, and think again. And obviously sanctions isn't going to achieve anything. It's only going to annoy Lukashenko even further, push him, do, do Putin's work for him. So, you know, let's pretend that, you know, that you know nothing very much happens and try to go back to where we were. That's the sensible thing. But they can't do that because, as I said, they have their monstrous egos. They're afraid to lose face in front of each other. The hardliners in Germany and the hardliners in Poland and the hardliners in the Baltic states can't bring themselves to accept that the whole color revolution thing in Belarus has failed when it clearly has. So they just press on and they press on regardless and if and they fail even more. But isn't that the whole story of the European Union in the last 10, 20 years? It's just, yeah. you know, just press on. <laughs> never, never, never draw no. back. Never think twice. I mean, you know, we, you know, let's just talk about the other country, Turkey as well. European Union, the European Union has over the last 10, 15 years, 10 years, it's managed to antagonize all the all the big countries that surround it russia turkey and of course britain is quitting the european union on bad terms doesn't that suggest that there is something wrong about the way they're doing things in brussels and berlin where the decisions are being made but do they say that to themselves do they say, well, you know, just a moment, we've got problems with Turkey, we've got problems with Russia, and we've got problems with Britain, three such completely different countries. That must mean that we're doing something wrong and we have to think again about what we're doing. Doesn't it occur to them that they've not got particularly good relations now with the United States, the most powerful country in the world and in the West? But, oh, no, they're not able to do that. So just press on, as they always have, making more mistakes, losing more battles, alienating more potential friends. But that's that's how they are. I mean, you know, you can't expect them to change because they're not going to. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, they just should have licked their wounds and said, we failed, we couldn't do the re regime change, the color revolution. It didn't pan out. Let's forget yeah. about it. And let's uh, let's start some diplomacy back up again with Lukashenko. Uh, that's what they should have said. That's well, the logical thing for them, for them to have said. So very quickly, let's talk about Turkey. Mm. Real quickly, and then wrap up the video. Yeah, I like the Turkey example in that now we're getting news that um, Greece and Turkey are going to start talking. They are going to go to the negotiating table. They are going to uh, open up dialogue. And from what I understand, they're going to try to solve this East Med impasse. That's that's the indications that we're getting. Um, a title from the Cyprus Mail, another article from Cyprus Mail says EU sanction threat on Turkey fades after it accepts talks with Greece. Now, I like this outcome because to me, this outcome was brought about outside of the European Union. In other words, what we saw was at times things getting very tense and there was the, the danger of conflict breaking out. But we saw France, Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, obviously countries outside the European Union, Italy, work together in, in a type of peace through strength kind of model to, to engage with Turkey, sometimes a little carrot, sometimes a little stick. But eventually, Turkey came around and also said, you know what, it's not worth risking conflict it, for, for, for this East Med uh, situation. We're up for talks as well. And even though Erdogan talked very tough, he talked a very big game, in all his speeches, there were slight indications that he also was ready to talk. So, I mean, this deal of getting Greece to sit down 
with Turkey, which also means getting France and, and getting all the all the people involved to sit down with Turkey and figure this thing out, which I hope they do. They do do. And I hope they take advantage of this opening was something that came about outside of the European Union, even though the European Union, I think, is going to try to to, to uh, take credit for this. Yeah, as, the, as they always do, as they always do. And you're absolutely right. If it had been done down to the European Union, the likelihood is we'd have had a war in the Eastern Med, Med because what they what they invariably do is they they um, they give discordant messages, which ultimately encourage the hardline forces in Turkey and with within on Erdogan's entourage and within that part of Erdogan's brain that looks for a fight. Now, what happened was instead we got traditional, classical state diplomacy. As you said, a coalition of states came together, Greece, Cyprus, Israel, Italy, and especially France. Um, they, they, did, they took a very strong, firm line. Erdogan realized, Turkey realized, this is too big a force for us to take on. And, and, and they pulled back. And that's how diplomacy should work. That is real diplomacy. That's real, proper, serious diplomacy. What the EU does isn't diplomacy at all. It's just, well, uh, sermonizing and provoking and appeasing all at the same time. Yeah, I totally agree with mm. you. There was uh, th it's a good outcome, and I'll say it again. I really hope yeah. that uh, Greece and Turkey and Cyprus and, and France take advantage of uh, of the opportunity that's been given to them, and yes. they solve the issue yes. in the East Med. So to everyone's benefit, absolutely. To every, it, you know, so that everyone in the region can can benefit from what's taking place there. Absolutely. I mean, it does show that sometimes a show of force is the right thing, and that's what that's what happened. That's what Greece and France and the others did. And it worked. That's, otherwise, as I said, it's appeasement and weakness. And if it's combined with sermonizing and provocative language, it would have ended in, in a shambles. But as I said, if it, had been, if it had been left to Brussels and Berlin, they'd have made a complete and total mess because the Germans were never interested in standing up to Erdogan. Yeah. You don't need the EU to conduct diplomacy. No, you don't want the EU. You don't, not only you don't, don't need it. You not only don't need the EU, you you absolutely don't want it there. The EU messes things up. It doesn't solve things. And yes, you're quite right, by the way. They will try and take credit for it. They always do. They'll, they'll make out that they're responsible for this. And um, um, they're not. As I said, they, they took a situation and they made it worse. And it was because some leaders, Mitsotakis and especially in Macron, and Cyprus stood firm that it, 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 the situation was brought back under control. But as I said, if it had been left to the EU, if it had been left to Merkel, my goodness. <laughs> I mean, the thought doesn't even bear, bear contemplation. I and mean, we would have had a disaster on our hands. All right, we'll leave it there. Alexander Mercurius, thank you very much, guys. Click on that subscribe button down below. When you, when you subscribe to our channel, you will get notified every time we publish a new video or go live. Hopefully, you'll get notified by YouTube. Also, make sure to donate to us on PayPal, Patreon, and subscribe. Start your donation. Helps this small but growing network of channels. We are now a network of channels. Um, report the news to you as best we can. We are a small team, but we are trying to get as much news to you as we possibly can. And go to the Durant shop, pick up some merchandise. Alexander's going to show you some new merchandise as well that he has. And... Also, go to our friends at Patriotic Legacy. They have a contest now, a giveaway. When you make a purchase on the Patriotic Legacy website, use the code DURAN20 at checkout. When you use DURAN20, you get 20% off. Use that code at checkout from the Patriotic Legacy's website. Get the 20% off, and you will automatically be entered to win a Patriot Beacon 3 pink, the color pink for Breast Cancer Awareness, Awareness Month. So go to the Patriotic Legacy Use that code DURAN20, get 20% off, get entered into the contest to win a Pink Patriotic Legacy. You also get a Duran Magic Mug with the USA flag on it as well in the contest. Hopefully, whoever's watching this video enters that contest and wins. And of course, it is for a good cause for breast cancer awareness as well. Alexander, what do you have for us? I have indeed the Patriot Beacon 3, but this one is black, not pink. But it is, to those who don't know, 
the best flashlight in the world, made in the United States, but as Alex rightly said, ship it ships everywhere uh, around the world. So wherever you are, you can participate in your in this contest and you can have one. And what is it? The best flashlight in the world and the Swiss Army knife of flashlights. Firstly, why is it the best flashlight in the world? Firstly, it's got the most powerful, amazing and brilliant beam. So in the darkest places, you can project it out and you can see the most extraordinary detail. It's amazing. It is absolutely wonderful how clear and uh, 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 bright the light is. You can dim it, as I've just done. So if you're in a, in a room uh, with lots of people, you can dim it. And if you're walking down a sort of dark road or you want to alert people to where you are, you can have it flashing. So it's got this tremendous quality of being a fantastic flashlight. But why is it also the Swiss army knife of flashlights, as Alex says? Because it does amazing things as well as just be a flashlight. Firstly, it is solar powered. So that means that you don't have to worry about batteries. You can just leave it out in the light and it's always there for you. And it's incredibly reliable in that way. You don't have to worry about, you know, if your battery runs out, you're, you're, without, a, you're without any light. But because it's solar powered, you can also use it. You can also use it to recharge other things. You've got a port there. You can recharge your smartphone, your iPad, your tablet, whatever, uh, your laptop. It's got the port. And of course, it's got other things too. It's got a compass in the handle, so if you're walking in the dark and you, you know, out of, out, you know, out of satellite, your sat nav isn't working or your GPS isn't working, well, you've got a, a, a compass there, so you can find your bearings very, very quickly. If you are driving, and I always drive now, wherever I go. Uh, in my car, I always have it with me. Well, it's it's an incredibly useful accessory. You can use it as a hammer. And if you have to find, if you encounter an accident and you have to get somebody out of their car fast, you can tap it, you can use it to break the windscreen, you know, each corner of your windscreen and it will just come down very quickly, very gently, very, very fast. And you can cut somebody out of their seat belt because you've got a seat belt cutter there too. So you've got all those wonderful things. And it's also, by the way, got a magnet in the handle, which you can find there. So when I, I have a, a metal uh, um, little, uh, you know, cover in my car and I just stick it there, and I can immediately get hold of it that way. Um, I would add that you can also, it's also got an alarm. Um, you can just press it like that, and it makes a wonderful noise. And by the way, that's a wonderful way for me to attract my dogs. When they hear that, they come running. So I don't have to worry. I can always find them very quickly, but you can also use it, obviously, again, to attract attention to yourself or, or to whatever is happening around you. So it's got all of these wonderful accessories, these, these wonderful functions. But the other reason it's the best flashlight in the world is because it is so beautiful and so beautifully made. It's one of these wonderful products the US makes. It's, it's strong, it's rugged. The mo when you hold it, you immediately feel your confidence rising because you've got this quality product in your hands. You know you are secure in your flashlight because you've got the best flashlight in the world. All you have to do is handle it. And in fact, you're handling the best flashlight in the world, the Patriot Beacon 3. This one is black. You're going to get it in pink. You do it for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Alex will remind you at the end of the program how to do it. And I would just again say, uh, as Alex said, you get a mug with it, and it's this mug, the mug, uh, Duran mug, with the flag of the United States, the great nation in which it is made. But it ships all around the world. And Alex is absolutely right. We have other products on our shop. 
Um, I've got my own Duran mug there. The Duran mugs, by the way, are the best mugs in the world, as I have pointed out many times. But it's got the flag of Britain. Alex is there with the flag of Greece. We got mugs with every national flag, I think, pretty much now, uh, or, or if not, very soon. And we're also getting flags with uh, uh, the flags of the individual states of the Great American Union of the United States. Alex will show you there mugs. Uh, this is also Germany, by the way. Um, uh, uh, enamel mugs. You've got porcelain mugs and enameled mugs. And, of course, we've now also got other things. And this is what has just come for me today. Um, and you can see it. And it's a hat. It's embroidered. And you will notice that I have been drinking tea. And it's got a, it's from a British mug, a mug with a British flag, because I'm after all the Oracle of London, as Alex always says. And here I am in Britain drinking from my British Duran mug. And you will see that I've got the flag of the United Kingdom on my beautiful embroidered hat. So I've got one hat. And as a matter of fact, I'm, aren't I lucky and happy? I've got two hats. And this one also has, by the way, the British flag. So you can see what amazing, marvelous, wonderful uh, hats these are. We have uh, baseball caps and truckers hats. And there's Alex. He's got one with Switzerland. I think that's Switzerland. Yes, I think it's definitely Switzerland. So you can see how wonderful they are. You can see perhaps even closely there. You can see Britain. That's Poland. There's There it is, different colors. Um, so you've got, as I said, baseball caps, truckers hats, embroidered hats, hats with the flags of many nations. We've also, of course, got our shirts, long-sleeved and short-sleeved T-shirts, polo shirts, uh, the best polo shirts in the world, bar none. And they also come increasingly with flags too, and embroidered and long-sleeved and short-sleeved and lots of wonderful shirts and hoodies too. So you can find them all in our shop together with our great gallery of eBooks. As Alex rightly said, you support our little great, well, actually great channel, great and growing channel by coming to our shop. And at the same time, you become the owner of these great things and do join that competition for a Patriot Beacon 3. Alex will quickly remind you how to do all these things. Just go to the Patriotic Legacy for the contest. You'll find the link in the description box down below and go to the Duran shop as well, durantshop.com. You'll find the link in the description box down below under this video. Alexander McCurse, thank you very much. Until next time, everybody, take care.